the recording is on. So we have a quorum, so we will get started today. Well, welcome Salt Lake City, and welcome to this January 11th Salt Lake City Council work session only meeting. As you can tell, we're back to being virtual. And as chair, uh, I determined after looking at the data and consulting others that uh, an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present based on the reports of the COVID cases. So that's why we return back to the uh, virtual public meetings. And we'll return back, we'll go back to hybrid or in person as soon as we determine it's appropriate and safe. Today, as I said earlier, is a work session only, and there's no public comments during a work session. However, join us on January 18th, next week, at 7 p.m. during the formal meeting to share any comments. And in the next couple, couple days, we'll determine whether the next week will be virtual, hybrid, or in person, and we'll keep you posted on that. Your feedback is always welcome, and you can share with the City Council anytime uh, by mailing us at PO Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114, or me emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com, or by calling our 24-hour phone comment line at 801-535-7654. And with that, we'll start our meeting with our first agenda item. As always, the update from the administration. Thank you very much, Mayor, for being here and joining us today. And we also have uh, on the screen, I think we have Rachel Otto, the Chief of Staff, Lisa Schaefer, Chief of Admin Officer, Andrew Johnston, the Director of Homeless Policy and Outreach, and I think also I saw Chief Brown on the uh, screen. Mayor, I turn the time over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In your first meeting chairing. Thanks, council members, for giving us a chance to give you an update. Um, if council staff could bring the slide deck up, that'd be great. Next slide, please. Thanks, Isaac. I've never had to say to you that the case rate is up 161%, but that's what the 14 day case rate is for Salt Lake County. And the surge is continuing. Utah has the fifth highest increase in cases in the nation right now. The COVID ICU utilization is still around 35%, but total ICU is full statewide. 96% um, is essentially full. And only 23% of our kids, 5 to 11, who are eligible to be vaccinated in the county have been vaccinated. Next slide, please. You know that the county put a 30-day mask requirement in place until February 7th, and that includes when you're waiting in line to go indoors. So even driving um, by some of the COVID lines that are um, walk up, not drive up, Sometimes I'll see people without masks on. They're now required to be wearing masks, whether you're waiting to get into a restaurant or have a COVID test or um, for anything. If it's a public space and you're in line for it, back, uh, masks are required. And nearly a quarter of our county residents are still unvaccinated. That's an even larger number, as you know, for Salt Lake City. We'll put that slide up in a moment, but we're at 67% fully vaccinated for our eligible population. So. 33% uh, of our residents are unvaccinated. And um, with the most recent numbers, we're at 83% of the county cases are unvaccinated or that their vaccinations are not up to date. So if you, um, let's say that you had both of your shots done and the second shot was more than six months ago and you have not had a booster shot, then you'd be considered in that unvaccinated population. Next slide, please. This is Salt Lake City's case data, and as you can see, we really only have through January 5th. Of course, today's the 11th, so it's not as up to date as some of what um, is just starting to come out through the state in the last hour. But uh, 
not looking good for us as a city, just as the, it is for the rest of the state. Next slide, please. And this is one from Dr. Dunn's presentation to the county council, and they meet at essentially the same time as you all meet. So um, this is new slide data that we're kind of plucking from the county council meeting and just bringing to you. Um, I don't have a, a, any notes to go along with it, but interesting information on ICU capacity coming from the county health department. And next slide also showing hospitalizations on the rise. And as you know, with the case numbers, we see a one to two week delay in those cases um, that will need hospitalization ending up uh, presenting at the hospital. So this we're just beginning to see the effect in the hospital of the wave that started early last week, which is predictable with the delay. And our last slide for this section is uh, the full zip code. We apologize that last week, 84101, I believe, was um, accidentally edited as we tried to zoom in and show the numbers bigger. So I think we, I hope we have all of our zip codes represented here. Citywide average, as I said, about 67%, and uh, not seeing a great deal of, of change in the last week. But I'll just take this chance again to encourage anyone who's listening who is not up to date on your vaccines to go to thisisourshot.com or .org and you can find out when you can get your free, no appointment necessary vaccine and um, dramatically increase your potential of uh, not having to be hospitalized if you end up infected with any of the variants. And if there's no questions for me on this section, then the next slide will take you to Andrew Johnston's part of our update for you. Any, uh, Mr. Chair? I think I saw Councilmember Mono still hold on. I just saw uh, Councilmember Fowler has a question. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I do have a question on the considered unvaccinated. Does this mean that people need to go get revaccinated? Do we have that? No. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. And I'm sure that I could have explained it better. But when you go, um, when you go to the Salt Lake County Health Department COVID dashboard and you look at the countywide case numbers, you'll see in blue the majority of the cases. And then if you look at the breakthrough tab, those will appear in sort of pink color. The pink are people who are up to date on their vaccines, meaning they either had that second shot less than six months ago, or they've had their booster. Um, the blue cases are those who are fully unvaccinated, partially vaccinated, or out of date on their vaccination status. Does that make sense? And in, in that case, more of a, um, statistical thing than it is a so it's tracking it's tracking those stats rather than saying if you haven't had your booster you have to start all over again right it's sort of right. if i can say kind of less of a health thing and more of a stat thing well the risk is um the, you can see in the way that the county is quantifying the t positive cases that the risk for hospitalization is um, similar, more similar between completely unvaccinated and if your vaccination is out of date, than if you're fully vaccinated uh, and up to date on your booster um, and out of date on your vaccine, if that makes sense. Your risk of hospitalization is far greater if you're not up to date on your vaccine. So the, the blue case numbers that you see on the county site there include out of date on vaccine and fully unvaccinated altogether. Got it. Thank you. Sorry that I was a little confused on that, but thank you, Madam Mayor. That's my okay. motto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question uh, is on the mask mandate, and I know this might not be a question for you, Madam Mayor, maybe it's for Angela, Dr. Dunn, but um, I know I've been hearing more about um, how Omicron is less protected by cloth masks and that, that we really need to be wearing the N95 masks. 
Is that at all talked about in the mask mandate or is it purely any kind of mask that is mandated? And I don't know if you're the right person to answer that, but. Sorry, I was muted. Um, are you, can you hear me okay, council members? Yes, yes. Okay, my screen is frozen, so I, I can't see you, but um, they do specify N95 masks and a number of other respirator types. Um, but the, you know, as I think the research has progressed throughout the pandemic, we are seeing that KN95 masks are dramatically more protective than cloth masks and even unfortunately more so than our beautiful Salt Lake City flag masks that we had made. So um, th they are specific about N95s in the county mask order. And Madam, or Madam Mayor, I don't see any questions at this time. You can go ahead and proceed. Um, can you pull the slides back up? The first slide you're going to see is the flow occupancy for the week of the first week of the year, first through the seventh of January. Uh, for those of you who are paying attention and memorizing the numbers week to week, you'll notice that it's gone down in occupancy since the previous week over the holidays. Uh, mostly related to the Miller Mixed uh, Resource Center that's dropped to 94% occupancy. Uh, the first week of a uh, month generally does see lower numbers, so that's not too unexpected. Uh, however, the uh, overall average is still above 97% for all of them. On the far right, you'll see St. Vincent de Paul, the dining hall overflow that's been open for several weeks now. Uh, we've talked before that it has an official uh, bed capacity of 58 beds, but because people will cycle through those, they keep the total number of folks who came in on, on average per night. And you can see they're um, filling those and more every night. Um, there really is literally no, no space there. We'll talk about the other, other flows in a moment. Next slide. Uh, we did end resource fairs for last year, but they're planning another one for this month. Uh, location will be determined shortly. The probably depending on weather and also uh, the overflow status of the uh, former Ramada Inn. Uh, cleaning and abatements um, have been on hold for the most part. Cleanings have happened, but not abatements. Um, the health department and the city are talking this week about uh, locations that may need to be addressed sooner than later. And the occupied vehicle response we've talked about for several uh, weeks now is up and running. It's a pretty regular schedule about twice a week. Uh, police department and the compliance department get together and go and address reported um, cars that have been uh, in stationary for a long period of time on certain areas and uh, request them to follow the ordinance to, to move uh, within 48 hours. Um, those that are abandoned, obviously, um, or just being used for storage may be towed. Um, other ones that are uh, occupied right now, there's an interaction between the outreach teams, the city departments, obviously, and the overflows as they come online to try and make sure that folks get inside instead of just um, lose the place to, to stay. Um, so that's going to be an ongoing discussion among all those providers. And those can be reported again through the Salt Lake City app, which is the, the best way to do that. Next slide. Uh, the Wiegand Center, the overflow that this council approved the temporary land use for uh, several months ago, did open its doors uh, last night, and they had 16 people there. Uh, they have a capacity of about 35 beds per night, and they expect that to increase uh, night overnight as they go forward this week. The High Needs Temporary Housing Program, formerly the Ramada Inn uh, on Redwood Road, is will be opening in stages. The first stage will probably begin next Monday, the 18th, um, but that will be a referral only stage. They've got a list of about 150 individuals over the age of 65 who are either unsheltered camping or in the current resource centers um, and those with some uh, underlying medical conditions that are higher vulnerability um, for health problems this winter will be prioritized first into those rooms. And um, again, like I said, that's referral. So there's not people lining up to get in every night. Um, they're targeted. And then there will be space opened up in some of the resource centers based on that as well. The idea is moving forward over the next several weeks uh, as more staff get hired by the road home, um, that they will also open up the more congregate overflow night to night out there. 
And the process would likely be that St. Vincent de Paul, the Wigan Center get filled, and then um, that one on Redwood Road, and they'll have transportation back and forth uh, in that order to keep it um, organized and make sure that they're maximizing the capacity of those two downtown. The best way to get access for everybody in the public is still the 801-990-9999 number um, that Utah Community Action Man's 24 hours a day. Uh, it's the best way to get information on availability, to get into the system, to get referred to the right place so you don't go from place to place looking for a, for a bed opening. Uh, I encourage everyone to use that number. Are there any questions about any of that? Any questions for Mr. Johnson? I don't see any, Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And Chief, I turn the time over to you. Thank you. And congratulations, Mr. Chair Dugan, on your new assignment, you and uh, Vice Chair Mono. Thank congratulations. You. Look forward to working with you this year. Council, it's good to be with you again. Uh, if you could please bring up my slide deck. This week, I'd like to uh, review a couple, a few of the goals that come from our revised control, crime control plan that Mayor Mendenhall, Mendenhall and myself rolled out. It's probably been a couple months and we've been speaking to over the last few weeks. Next slide, please. And the first goal that we want to talk about is response times and give you an update on response times. The response times for December of 2021 for priority one calls, priority two calls, and priority three calls are 1046 respectively for priority ones, uh, 1655 for priority twos, and 3547 for priority threes. Now, keep in mind that priority ones are in progress, emergency 911 calls, uh, persons crimes, ones that are of the highest uh, emergency that we will drop everything we can and try to get to. Next slide, please. So here's an update on our improvements. Now, if you look to the left box, that's November of 2021. To the right is December of 2021. Priority one calls, the average response time difference between November and December 10th is two minutes and 12 seconds. Priority two calls, the time difference is between, between November and December is three minutes and 13 seconds. And priority three, the average response time difference between November and December 15th or December is 15 minutes and 12 seconds. This is a this is a huge improvement, and we're making good progress on this. Although it's good, um, there's still more still more work to do. It's my goal in a priority one response that we be under 10 minutes, and so we will continue to to work on that, and uh, look at different ways that we can achieve that goal. And council, as we go along, if you have any questions, please, we don't have to wait to the end, please raise your hand or jump in. Now, another thing that goes right along with response times is the number of calls that we're going to. And if you look at the next slide, this, we track calls, calls for service. And this slide is from week 52, which is December 27th of 2021 to January 2nd of 2022. You'll notice in that box for 2021 that we responded to 2,285 calls for service uh, in that week. When you compare that to 2020, which was up substantially, I mean, everybody said 2020 was this anomaly of a year, but 2021 is an anomaly plus some. We're still going on more calls for service. We went to 176 more calls for service in 2021. So the calls for service are still uh, increasing. If you look over the year, the year of 2021, our officers responded to 127,668 calls for service. This is an increase from 2020 of 4,303 calls for service. So for our officers, they're still going call to call. Things are not slowing down for them, but this is a huge accomplishment for the department. And I have to say, this speaks uh, to the heart and to the dedication of our officers. This credit goes to them and for the work they're doing on our street to serve the community of Salt Lake City. Next slide. 
One of the strategies of the revised control crime control plan is the impl to implement and expand our, our telephonic and reporting capabilities. So what we've done in October, the Salt Lake City Police Department started a program to increase the number of officers available to take those telephonic calls for service. So from October 20th of 2021 to January 3rd of 2022, Salt Lake City Police Department officers handled 2,092 calls for service in this telephonic response. These officers generated 577 reports. That's 29% of those 2,000 calls, reports are written. The thing to understand is these calls will sit in a queue and wait for officers to be dispatched. On this new program, these telephonic officers are taking these calls for service, freeing up the officers on the street to, to go and to handle those high priority in progress emergencies. The average telephonic officer is handling about 29 calls for service per shift, which is a huge improvement. And council, as we move forward, this, this will go into our, our police civilian response team, but this is a great program to, to launch us forward as we move into different ways and strategies to reduce the calls for service that our officers are going on. Any questions? If not, next slide. Another goal of the revised crime control plan is to reduce crime, uh, simply to reduce crime. The first week of 2021 to December 26th of 2021, overall crime is down citywide 5.4%. 5, 5 In that same time period, over the five-year average, citywide crime is down 1.3%. In the last 28 days, five of the seven council districts show a drop in violent crime and property crime, not only in those 28 days, but in the seven days as well. Now, this is this is good news, but there's still more work to do. Um, and to, to, to kind of illustrate that point, uh, we had a our, our weapons offenses, if you look there on the bottom, are up 33 percent in the last 28 days. This is this is a lot of this is concerning to us as a department and to me as the chief. One example is the drive by shooting that occurred on December 26 of 2021. In the middle of the afternoon, uh, officers responded to an apartment complex located within a thousand feet of uh, a church and elementary school. Um, our officers got on scene and found that six bullet holes had pierced through that apartment, but not just one, two. Um, thank goodness nobody was there and nobody was injured. So. Uh, that's the good news. But on paper, violent crime is down 10% in the last 28 days for, for, the, but for that family and maybe those families living in that apartment. Violent crime is up and, and it's probably at an all time high for them. So we have more work to do as well. And then last, the third goal or one of the, the three of the four goals is to to become or to to fill our funded and unfunded sworn positions. I'm happy to announce that on Monday we we uh, we started a new class, Recruit Class 156, and we welcomed 27 potential new officers into the police department. Um, this is one of our goals. I want to, I'm proud to announce that eight of the of the recruits are, are female. There is a high uh, number of, uh, I'm sorry, go to the next slide. I'm, I'm behind on the slides. <laughs> next slide, please. There they are. Eight female officers, a large group of that uh, of the, of this class has a diverse background and very unique life experiences. Uh, we welcome to that to that day. They were sitting in their in their best uh, clothes, their ties and suits. But before the day was over, they were doing push-ups. So we're excited to have them. They're 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 welcome welcome to our department. And really, we've talked about the vacancies we have with the hiring of these 27 uh, recruits. Our vacancies are down to 33 positions. So there's more to come with hiring of lateral classes and another class in May, but we're making good strides in a lot of those goals. So thanks for the time, Council, and I'll answer any questions if you have any. Thanks for that information, Chief. Uh, Councilman Armano, did you have a question? Yeah. On the 33 vacant positions, is that, uh, how many, does that include the unfunded vacancies or is that only funded vacancies? Those are the funded ones, sir. Yeah, we, we yeah, still have we 20 unfunded. Okay, so we can actually hire more than 33 people into upcoming recruit classes. Okay, thanks. Correct, yeah. 
Any other questions for the chief? Hey, chief. Um, which two districts did not see a decrease in crime? I believe, uh, council member, it was district one and district two. Thanks. Any other questions for the chief? Thanks again, chief. Uh, I got a message from um, Andrew Johnson. He wants to, he's got one more uh, point to make back on the homeless side. So Andrew, back to you. I, I apologize, council chair and council for the my oversight. The annual point in time count for the state of Utah for those experiencing homelessness is in two weeks from now. And um, as you know, this relies on volunteers to be executed every year. They're looking for 500 volunteers for Salt Lake County to uh, get as accurate and count as possible. And so those who are interested, it is on January 27th, 28th, and 29th, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, early in the morning, 4 to 6 a.m. Um, it's a great time to be up and about in the wintertime. And uh, anybody can volunteer. There's a website at endutahhomelessness.org, point in time count. I can send that out to you. Um, it's open to anybody who wants to volunteer. All the training is available both online and in person. It's not complicated. It just takes um, some effort really and driving around with some of your friends. Uh, and it really be helpful for the entire, uh, obviously for the, the county and the state uh, to give this accurate information to help make uh, plans and also uh, get the funding needed for services. So uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Can you say that website again? Sure can. EndUtahHomelessness.org, and then uh, you'll find a point in time count link on there. It's just forward slash point uh, dash in dash time dash count forward slash. You'll see it when you get to the website there, and they'll have a scroll down to get to the Salt Lake, Salt Lake City, and there's actually a link there. You can fill out everything online. Thank you, Chairman Fowler. I'm not the chair anymore, the chair. Right. So, <laughs> so cheers for, for that. No, um, Andrew, you mentioned you would get that to us. If you would, that'd be great. I'd love to put an email blast out for um, people at my last Sugar House Community Council meeting. Um, there was a lot of interest in just what we're doing right now during these cold temperatures with people experiencing homelessness. So I, I would love to do an email blast um, to those people signed up for my email newsletter. So if you could get that to us, this is mostly me also being like, hey, staff, please help me do that. Um, also, I like the haircut, Andrew. Looking dapper. I, I mean, I have to admit, I do miss the like mad professor look, but. I appreciate uh, both offers, well, the offer and the, um, the feedback. It's a compliment, Andrew. It's a compliment. <laughs> Very kind. <laughs> I will definitely get the information out to uh, the council uh, staff and council members as soon as I can, even today, so you can have that and, and send it out if you'd feel um, so obliged. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Chair. Chief, can I go ahead? Can, yeah, can I make one more correction, please, to, to council member Peter Eschler's question? It was districts five and three, not one and two. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Uh, any other updates, Madam Mayor? Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor, and I appreciate uh, all your help and support here. We'll move on to item number two. There is no update today for the uh, racial equity, so we'll move on to item number three, which is, let me pull it up, the amendment to require a notice for permits to work in the public way follow-up. And on our screen, we should have Nick Tarbett, Kimberly Citrus, the senior city attorney, and Matt Cassell, the city engineer. I see Nick and Kimberly. Take it away, Nick. And there's Matt. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is an item that is about a year in the making. The council was first briefed on this last January. Um, and as you mentioned, this is for proposed amendments to city code. Um, for permit applications for construction work in the public right away. The council had a briefing on this last January and a public hearing. Um, after the public hearing, there was another briefing where 
based on public comments, the council asked for some changes to the proposed ordinance. Those key changes included that underground work would be part of the notification requirements as well. Notification should be provided before obtaining the permit and proof must be part of the permit application. The applicant is also responsible to provide proof that the notice was given and as well also ask for, ask for some specific requirements to be included in the notice about the purpose of construction, the contact information, the date of the construction, et cetera, just so that the public knew what was gonna be happening with that work. So those were the changes that the council directed the staff to make. They have been made. Um, there's a table on page two of your briefing materials that outlines where those were included in the um, draft ordinance. And so what we're asking here today is if these changes met the expectations of the council, if we successfully did that, if so, we're recommending that we now put these out to public comment. Um, there was quite a few that were interested in this during the initial public hearing. Um, some of these changes probably won't satisfy their concerns, but we still want to reach back out to all the stakeholders so they're aware of them and we can get any more public feedback. So that's the intro. If does uh, council members have any questions on these? I open up the floor. Any questions for? I have one question. Oh, go ahead. Um, Councilmember thank Fowler. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, um, I, I think this, for me at least, it addresses some of the issues that we heard at the last briefing. Um, I did notice, and I'm just curious about this, that in the project timeline, we have two public hearings set. Is this because we have gone back to remote and we sort of had an unofficial policy of having two public hearings when we are remote rather than, I mean, we, we kept, obviously we had a public hearing earlier, but we kept it open because of these questions. So I see Cindy popped on, but just curious about that. It's not our intention to return to that approach unless asking the council. And um, so this is the second hearing because it is um, it is modified, but I don't think we intend to have two more hearings. Got it. Also, I read it wrong because we're now in year 2022 of year 300 and 3045 <laughs> of pandemic. So uh, my bad. It, you could have been right for all I knew. Thank you. <laughs> I just know so. that we did do that at the, the when we first went remote. I don't. I don't want us to go back to that necessarily. So it just caught my attention. That's yeah. all. And people from the public, um, we had some complaints about doing two because it was um, it was creating some confusion. So. Any other questions? Nick, Nick, I have one question on the, uh, mm -hmm. the contact information. You know, in, in the past, a lot of times a phone number was for a uh, Verizon or some uh, worker that was out of state, out of the local area, and there was not a local contact information. Is the contact information going to be provided, going to be a local person that they can actually talk to? And is there going to be just more than just that one time? Uh, communication with the property owners. Can I, uh, I apologize if I may ask Matt to respond to that one. We can make sure that there's local contact information. That's a very good point. And we can make sure that, that we clear that up that we're asking for local contact and not someone at some remote uh, center. So yes, we can do that. And could you just remind the public and, and probably the members here, the, the contact, uh, timeline before it is it just once or is it going to be multiple times where they're going to attempt to contact people if they're working in the, in the right away we will attempt one time and we will verify that that one time was uh successful before we'll issue the permit okay because i know there's been some requests for more than just once but uh, uh let me go back at some of my emails and look at that I know this is kind of a slowing down the process, but I want to make sure that people are getting the uh, 
they know that when work's going in front of their yard, that they're not getting their strip torn up uh, without their notice. Uh, notice. Well, and I, I'm hoping this adds to the, the outreach. Verizon's a perfect example. They are doing pre-construction notification. This is adding before the permit's issued. So there would be a pre-permit notification and a pre-construction notification so people can see the project coming to them. Council Member Baltimore. Thanks, uh, Chair, and congratulations on your first meeting. <laughs> Matt, I have a question for you. So, so that phone number um, that that needs to be provided, will that be for um, troubleshooting? So some of our constituents are saying, hey, they're doing work outside my sidewalk and there's a bunch of equipment left over and it's midnight and I cannot access you know my house or my driveway so is that phone number for that as well where somebody can call and say hey you guys left something here can you come get it because there's nowhere for me to park and I need to get into my house right it is for that that will help them as construction's going on when there's problems they have contact our information will also be on that that form. So we'll have our contact information, the contractor's information. We always try to have the people closest to the project being able to handle those issues. If the contractor's not around or not able to it, then they have another phone number to contact us and we can try to help resolve the problem. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. That's it. Any further questions on this item? All right. Mr. May, may I ask one question for staff? <laughs> so, and, and I apologize, Councilmember Fowler. So our intent is to have one more public hearing where the public can come and comment on it. It's not two, it's just we'll set it up for February so that there's time. We will send this to the stakeholders. I'll work with the ad administration to get to those stakeholders and make sure everybody hears about this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item number four and a briefing on the city's annual financial audit report. I have uh, Cindy Gus Jensen sitting in for Jennifer Bruno. I think we should have Mary Beth Thompson, the chief financial officer, and Michael Michelson from the partner of Eddie Bailey on the screen. There we are. Take it away, Thank Cindy. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we have uh, Paul Skeen and Michael Mickelson. Ide Bailey is our audit firm. The contract for the audit, uh, annual financial audit for Salt Lake City is with the legislative body. So it is your contract and um, it's also yours as the RDA board. So the city um, council by um, statute is responsible to assure that the city's finances are audited annually and um, this is the, the mechanism to do that. Um, there are many component parts to it. Component parts is a is a specialized term but pieces I'll say. Many, many pieces or chunks to it. There's the airport audit that's done separately, the public utilities audit, but those all um, wrap up into um, being your uh, responsibility as a city council. Today's um, briefing will focus largely on the um, the main um, city city budget and audit. They work very closely with the administration on this. Um, the firm that we have on contract, we try to also include in their contract opportunity for follow up work in case the city council has some questions that they would like expert help on. Um, so keep that in mind as you, as you have questions throughout the year, they can be a resource for you. So I will turn the time now over, um, unless Mary Beth uh, would like to say something, we'll turn the time over to um, either Paul or Michael, not sure who will take the lead. Cindy, thank you. This is Paul. Um, 
you gave all the things that I hope to do as my introduction, just pointing out. Oh, the, sorry. The, oh, no, you you do it very well. <laughs> um, I, just to reinforce what Cindy shared is that we are um, employed and contracted by the council, not by the financial management team. And so uh, in that, in the spirit of that, we do want to make ourselves available to the council um, should there be follow-up questions or things you'd like a deeper dive on, Mike and myself are available at, at your request to address those issues. Um, that said, we spend a va the vast majority of our time working with the financial team, probably to your relief. I don't think that anyone wants to spend a minute longer with auditors than they have to, uh, but Mary Beth gets to, to bear that, that uh, burden and, and does it quite well. Um, one of the things that, that I think is important to, to um, drive home is the fact that we are independent of the city and the, the many component units, as, as Cindy pointed out, the, the airport utilities, the library, RDA, all have separately issued audits and we are um, independent. We do a lot of work to make sure that there are no conflicts of interest or anything in those relationships that would cause us to, to impair that independence. Uh, we, uh, I'll give you the, the Reader's Digest version of, of our reporting and then talk a little bit about a, a finding or two that we had. Um, the audit was a clean audit, meaning we issued an unqualified opinion. There were no exceptions to our opinion. Um, that it's a substantial amount of work that goes into getting to that point. We typically start our procedures the end of July and we um, issued on December 23rd, I believe this year. So it, it does take a, a significant amount of time by the financial team and our team to, to make this happen. Uh, a couple of things to, to note, um, Mary Beth has put together a fantastic team. Uh, the the accounting world is like many other industries where talent is is hard to come by. Uh, and this is as strong a team as, as we've worked with. Very, very capable individuals. They take their jobs very serious. They uh, are um, very dedicated to making sure that they're performing their duties in a way that protects the city and, and reports things accurately. Um, one of the, the key members of the team, uh, Teresa Beckstrand, will be retiring and has had uh, a, a part in the, the audit for decades <laughs> and is a, a critical knowledge source. And so um, as that transition has been taking place and working towards that, there are a lot of complexities and, and a lot of work reconciling different statements, different accounts, different departments. Um, we just emphasize uh, the importance to do really a deep dive and make sure that there aren't any of those things that have become institutional knowledge that are retiring with Teresa, uh, that those are covered. And, and so that will be a challenge for Mary Beth and her team this year to make sure that um, there isn't anything that, that's missed in, in the transition process. And I, have a lot of confidence in the team and their ability to do that. Uh, but the, there's, there's a lot to, to document and to make sure it's, it's tied down. Um, in, in that spirit, there were a couple of areas where we found, um, and some of it's due to the timing of the audit, we don't wait until the books are completely closed to start our audit procedures or we would never issue by uh, December. Uh, so there's a little bit of, of work that the financial team's doing to close out as we're starting to test. And there were a number of areas. One area that we want to emphasize um, that has been um, troublesome, not from a reporting standpoint, because we've got to the right number every year, but there is a lot of work that goes into making sure that the housing loans are reconciled to the records that the financial team has. And I know that there's been a system transition there that um, the team, both teams on the housing side and the financial management side have worked hard to, to implement that and that should help. But we do, that was one of those areas where uh, reconciliation needs to be reviewed and made sure that, that all those accounts are tied down um, 
again, by the time we issue the audit, we've got it taken care of, but I think that, that would save headache on both sides if, if there were some more effort in the interim put into making sure that those things are taken care of. Um, so with our roles, uh, I'm responsible for the overall financial audit uh, as far as the annual comprehensive financial report, um, which is what I've just talked about. Um, Mike Mickelson, uh, one of my partners, uh, handles the single audit, which is the testing of the federal expenditures, and then also the state compliance and internal control work. And so I'll let him talk a little bit about those reports, and then we'll wrap up. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. Uh, in addition to the auditor's report and the ACFR, we've also issued a single audit reporting package that includes three additional auditor's reports. The first one deals with government auditing standards. Uh, by state statute, any governmental entity in the state of Utah that has a financial statement audit is required to have that audit performed in accordance with government auditing standards. Those standards come from the Comptroller General of the United States and require this additional report. So uh, the report deals with internal control over financial reporting and compliance in other matters. In the section related to the internal control over financial reporting, we referred to a couple of findings in the back of our report uh, that are documented there that Paul's already discussed. They were related to a couple of the things in the financial statement audit. On the compliance side of that report, we did, we, uh, did not have any instances of non-compliance to report there. So that was an unmodified report with a reference to the two findings that have previously been discussed. The next report in that document deals with state compliance. Last year, we had a couple of uh, findings related to compliance with state statutes. This year, we had none. So the two that uh, we had last year have been resolved. Well, I know that one of them has been resolved. I'll put it that way. The Fraud risk assessment that the state auditor's office requires uh, government entities to complete and uh, review with the governing body was completed during fiscal 2021. Uh, the other one from the prior year was related to the use of the BNC road funds. And that's something that we just have to audit every third year. And so uh, we didn't audit that this year, but based on our inquiries, this year as follow up, uh, there was uh, that that has been resolved. There have uh, been procedures put in place to make sure that the type of expenditure that snuck through last year won't sneak through again. And so this year we had an unmodified report on state compliance with no state compliance findings. And then the final report in that document deals with the single audit of the federal funds. Uh, we had four programs, four programs that were selected as major. The uniform guidance out of the CFR that uh, establishes the single audit procedures requires that we use a risk-based approach to selecting the major programs. A couple of them were new programs this year because of the CRF and uh, other COVID-related funds that came from the federal government to the city. And one of the others was the airport improvement program. There's a, a lot going on at the airport. And so with the additional things going on there, as well as some of that coming out of the, the COVID relief programs, uh, the airport improvement program, again, was a major program this year. And then the fourth one was a CDBG program. So the risk-based approach we have in selecting those major programs requires that programs over a certain level uh, be audited once every three years. And so CDBG came up again this year uh, for audit along with those COVID relief funds. Uh, so that report related to the single audit discloses no instances of noncompliance and no instances of internal control related to noncompliance. And so I'm going to emphasize how uh, good that is this year with the 
volume of COVID-related money and brand new programs out there, and in some cases where the federal government continues to change how those programs should be run from month to month, to not have a finding in those new COVID programs is really exceptional. So I, I just want to bring that up and let the, the city council know how uh, hard the people inside the city have worked to make sure that those funds are spent appropriately and within federal guidelines. Uh, Michael, I'm sorry, this is Cindy. Could I ask you something on that to clarify? Certainly. Uh, when you were saying that you did a lot of auditing at the airport, which is always the case in terms of their federal funds and, and grants yep. and such. And then when you're speaking of COVID program funds, are you mostly referring to the airport? How, tell us how much you worked on the funds that came to the city for distribution to um, various programs and organizations and such. Was that a was it mostly airport or did you, were you able to get um, a handle on the other funds? I know you only have to you can yep. only do a certain amount. Yep. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. So as I mentioned, we, we had four major programs and the airport was only one of the four. The other two that were COVID related relate to the emergency rental assistance and the coronavirus relief fund. And both those programs are at the city. Great. Now, volume wise, the airport was the biggest chunk of the total funds that we did audit, but those two programs were specifically at the city, not at the airport. Mm -hmm. And we looked at those. Great, that's great. Yeah, and thank as you. I was, sure, as I was getting ready to say, we did do a bunch of pushing back on the coronavirus relief fund because uh, that one lets you use the money for anything related to COVID. Well, anything related to COVID is kind of broad. And so, there were some expenditures there where we pushed back and said, well, we'd like you to explain to us how this relates to COVID relief. Because uh, some things are pretty obvious, you know, PPE and those types of things. But there were other instances of, of things, expenditures that seemed less obvious to us. But in every case, documentation was provided and an explanation was provided and how they were lead, related to uh, related to COVID, whether it's, you know, uh, remote working for employees or actual testing. I mean, it's just really broad, but we were comfortable that everything was spent appropriately. And, and I just want to let you know that we did push back on that in the instances where things seem to be less related to COVID uh, or maybe not as obviously related to COVID. Uh, so that's the summary of, of that report uh, related to the federal funds. Uh, at the end of the document is uh, management's summary of the findings from last year and how those have been remediated, if, if you want to go uh, read that, but uh, all of those have been remediated. Uh, and it also talks about the findings that Paul has already discussed related to his audit of the financial statements. So any questions on what we do on the federal side? Can I open up the table? Go ahead, uh, Councilmember Fowler. Thank you. Hi, Michael. It's good to see you again. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about the remediation of the federal compliance, I mean, I know that the COVID, we didn't have anything, but you also mentioned the some compliance issues from last year that have since been taken care of. That was on a state level, right? Right, those related to the, the state compliance findings from last year. Okay, and where in the report, because it's a, I appreciate guys, it's a long wordy report. So can I find those, that compliance and um, how the city fixed its compliance issues? Okay, that's a good question. And uh, thank you for uh, pointing that out. The requirements are for the financial statement findings and the federal findings. And so the, the state ones don't go into that report at the, the remediation report at the back. So I apologize for that. But I did report verbally that they had been remediated, so. Okay. Um, can I 
Was it just a, like a procedure thing? Uh, okay, so last year there were two state compliance findings. One of them related to this uh, broad risk assessment that the state auditor is prepared and has government entities go through. And it kind of is, uh, assigns based on the score you get, whether you're a, a high risk or low risk or moderate risk related to fraud. And that's required to be prepared and, and reviewed with the city council. In 2020, that was not done. We verified through the minutes and saw the document that that was done in 2021. The other finding related to expenditures for BNC road funds. In the prior year, there was an expenditure that was very trivial, but compliance testing is yes or no versus whether it's material or not. So even though it was trivial, we had to, to report the one instance of a, an expenditure that did not comply with the BNC road requirements uh, from the state. This year, based on our inquiry, since we didn't have to audit it, they put more uh, stringent reviews in place so that that type of expenditure doesn't happen again. And that was, uh, I think it had to do with a, a gift, a retirement gift or something. And while employment uh, salaries and, and related benefits are allowable, uh, end of employment gifts are, are not part of what's allowable for BNC roads. And so that snuck through in 20 and 21. They say they looked at things much tighter and much harder to make sure nothing like that snuck through. And that was based on inquiry instead of audit procedures because that's on a three year rotating, rotating basis on that. Great. Thank you, Michael. Does that answer your questions? Sure does. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? I, sorry, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, I, I am curious a little bit on the housing division loans and what, I mean, I, I know that we, we have an exemplary uh, thumbs up from you guys, but I'm just curious and sort of a little more information on, on what you saw there and what that looks like. Um, and if there's something from a policy standpoint that we need to be considering. I know that you probably don't have recommend, re recommendations for policies, but um, just sort of what maybe you've found there. Yeah, yeah, I can dive a little deeper into that. Um, I don't know that I would say that there's a policy adjustment that needs to be made. It's more that the, the communications and the data transfer between housing and, and the financial team uh, needs to be improved. I think the awareness of the issue will help. Um, essentially, housing tracks the loan balances in their own system that, that's not integrated into the financial reporting system for the city as a whole. And getting updated and timely information to the financial team in order to close their financial records has uh, been a little problematic. So housing has, has a new system to track those. We had a few wrinkles that we worked through as we tested that, that were resolved again. So it, it as you said, it, it all washed out um, in a way that was satisfactory and we got the right number there. Um, so that's just our, our advice is to make sure that throughout the year, not just at year end, that there's some reconciliation of what the housing has in their records to what city financial amounts are. Mr. Chair, if I may follow up. Paul, is this from, we have, as, as people may know, and I'm sure we've transferred some housing loans from CAN over to RDA, and I know that you also do our audit for RDA. Is this, this is just in relation to housing loans that are coming yeah. out of community and neighborhoods. It's Correct. not coming out of RDA. Right. That is correct. That is correct. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I had all of that information clear for me. So um, at this point, after working with CAN and housing, it's it, what I'm understanding, I'm just going to put it in layman's terms so I make sure I get it all, is that there's sure. sort of more of a communication, follow through, keep track of things, and then make sure finance had it so they understood so that we weren't doing all of this sort of 
end of the year stuff, right? Um, that we yeah. kind of could keep track throughout. Yes, well said. Okay. Council member Fowler, what I will say is the new ERP. Can you hear me? Yeah. The new ERP, what we are hoping is that new ERP will do a full integration with their new system. So then those receivables and the revenues coming in will be balanced on a monthly basis rather than happening to have this outside subsystem and it not communicating with the financial system. Go ERP. <laughs> Thanks, Mary Beth. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Balmors? No, that was my question. Um, Mary Beth answered that for me. Thank you. Thank you. Council Chair, um, can I also bring up, I have to mention that risk assessment that um, Mike Mickelson was discussing. Um, I need to present it to you officially, so I am presenting it to you officially right now for fiscal year ending 2021. As part of the state compliance portion of the yearly financial audit, the state auditor's office requires the city to complete, sign, and present the council the fraud risk assessment document. This document is in your packet. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. And also, thank you, Michael and Paul, uh, for the uh, briefing and the uh, report. Mary Beth, nice work. And uh, kudos to your, your team. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Chair. So there's no other further questions. We'll move on to item number five, redistricting, legal requirements and considerations. Boy, this is a good one. We got the table we have or on the screen. Someday we're gonna have a table where we're gonna actually have people sitting on a table. Just have positive thoughts about that. Uh, we have Ben Lutke, Katie Lewis from the attorney's office and Boyd Ferguson also from the attorney office. Wherever Ben is, there you are, Ben. Take it away. Thanks, Mr. Chair. The attorney's office have updated a memo from the last redistricting 10 years ago. And the memo includes an overview of statutes at multiple levels of government and case law established in the courts. So this looks at the legal requirements of redistricting as well as several considerations that you can keep in mind. Now, before I turn the time over to City Attorney Katie Lewis and Senior Attorney Boyd Ferguson, I have several redistricting updates for the council. So first is a general timeline of the process over the next four months. This week, a two week application period is expected to begin for the Resident Advisory Commission. This commission will recommend maps to the council. The application period will be announced through all of the council's usual communication channels. 10 years ago, the council also used a Resident Advisory Commission, so we're following that process this time as well. The commission is envisioned to have at least one member for every council district, and there could be more. In February and March, the commission will meet approximately four times, and that's based on how long the commission 10 years ago took to get their recommended maps for the council. We're planning a citywide postcard to all residents so they can be invited and informed about how to participate in the redistricting process. Once the commission recommends the map or maps, they may have multiple options for you to consider. In April, the council would review those maps and hold public hearings. And the legal deadline for the council to adopt a map is May 10th. So either May 10th or sooner, so it doesn't get too far into the annual budget process. Now, we have a dedicated website, um, web page on the council's website for all things related to city redistricting. And it is publicly available, it's been published. It's tinyurl.com forward slash SLC redistricting. This is like the dedicated web page for the budget. So it's updated periodically as the process moves forward. 
and it's the central location for briefing videos, timeline, summaries of what's happened, documents, mapping files, everything that we can put in one place so it's easy to find. We're also using the same mapping software as the state for redistricting. And the city's mapping tool is going to have some additional information, such as a layer showing a population heat map. And this includes populations for specific blocks. For example, there could be one block that has 400 residents, and an adjacent block might have only 40 because it's mostly commercial. So it's got a finer grain of information for the people to see. The tool is still in development and it will allow residents to draw and submit recommended maps. The county council is reviewing new voting precincts and may approve them today. To the extent possible, keeping voting precincts within a council district makes it easier for the county clerk to administer an election and count the votes. Once those new voting precincts are approved, they will be sent to the state and integrated into the statewide voter database. And then we can add them into the city's mapping tool and then publish it for the public to use. So that was, that was a lot really quick, but I wanted to get the information in front of you today. Are there any questions before I turn it over to Katie and Boyd for an overview of the memo? Uh, ben, go ahead. Council Member Fowler. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Ben, do you, we have a, a graphic of the timeline for this that we can send out to like our different community councils and things? I know that in my community council, I mentioned it the other day and, you know, tried to encourage people to refer and um, get people for that commission. But if I don't want to add too much work, but if we could get maybe a graphic, if we don't have one already of the timeline, that might be helpful for residents to understand. I've got your request and we'll work on it. Thanks, Ben. Any other questions for Ben? Ben, is this, is this a good time to discuss the eligibility of the uh, working group or should we wait till uh, Katie's, after Katie's briefing. Uh, we can definitely discuss the eligibility. If you had a specific criteria you wanted to bring up to your peers. Yeah, is this, uh, I'm looking at the 2011 staffing report on the eligibility for the uh, working group. And I'll backtrack in 2011, they had one member from each district plus two for uh, the school board. We don't have to, uh, the concern of the school board is uh, not existent now, so we just need, need to have representative from the seven districts. We're not gonna, we don't really uh, need to discuss how many on the uh, working group. It should be based more on how many applications we have. But their eligibility, what we did from in 2011, and we could get a straw poll going here, so then we can put out the application. And they said that, uh, the eligibility commission members are not considered eligible if any of the following conditions exist. They are not a registered voter at the time of appointment. And within the past three years, they have been a candidate for elected office, appointed or elected to a, any public office, an officer of a political party, a registered lobbyist, and an officer on any candidate's campaign committee. If there are any of those above, then they would be ineligible to be a uh, on the working group. If people are, if council members are, are okay with that, we open to discussions. We can use that as a basis for the application process. Councilmember Bala Morris, I'm, I'm okay. With, um, the question that I had for eligibility was: Do they also need to be residents of the district, or could they own a business? in the district. And I don't know if that's clarified there. No, I don't think in those exceptions. I mean, in those. Um... It, in that exception, it, it's not says that they are uh, resident, but 
the way we were looking at it, I think in the past was that they were residents of each of the districts. Okay. So they were actually a resident uh, with an address, not just a business owner of the address. Okay. All right. Thank you. If there's any, if there's any concerns or want to add any other uh, eligibility requirements, that's what they used in 2011. Go ahead, uh, Councilmember Mono. Um, I guess my one question would be, uh, I mean, we're looking at how I'm looking in the staff report about the, the piece where population means total population. However, registered voter is a subset of the total population. Would we have any interest in but you know, like the council districts and the representation from the counts on the city council affects everyone that lives in the district, not just people that are registered voters or have that privilege of voting. So, do we want to have some members of the count of the commission that may not be qualified to vote, but are also you know important members of our community? Are there any legal considerations to doing that? I, I would assume not, but that's one thing where I guess I would want to discuss with the rest of the council whether or not it's appropriate to invite people that that are not registered voters to participate in this process um because in the end it affects everybody not just people that are registered voters and and i think that the um it looks like court case law indicating that districts need to be based on total population not voting population i think could be good basis for us to understand that this affects total population not just the voters so should we in, include total population um, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily advocating for that yet, but I would like to discuss that with the rest of the council. I open up the floor. Councilmember Fowler. I mean, I'm okay taking away barriers as much as we can. And so if if we need to just open it up, if, if we take that away, I'm more interested in um, how long or how connect, maybe not connected is the wrong word, but how invested a, a member of our community is in their district with the knowledge and stuff, then whether or not they can vote, right? And to your point, Council Member Mono, it is, based on total population, not total voting population. So, you know, um, luckily felons in Utah can still vote, but there are other reasons that people may not be eligible to vote, but we would still want to hear their voice. Um, so I am okay taking that restriction, that sort of ineligibility restriction away um, and just adding the and I think it, it was in there, one of the, the one of the qualifications we had talked about last year is how long have you lived in the district? You know, you have to, to be eligible, live three years in the district or some, some number, right? Um, so that we have more of that, you're, you're not just moving in and then saying, oh, I think that this should, you know, I've lived here three weeks and now I think that I know the community, right? But you have some longevity there. so. That's more important to me than, to your point, Councilmember Mono, than this other sort of restriction and barrier that we'd be putting on people to to participate in this. Councilmember Fowler, the current application includes the question: How long have they resided in the city, and how long they've resided in the current council district? To try and get at that point of what is their you know history in the city, but also specifically to the district. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. That's my Um, Going to that question of voting eligibility, would we be considering maybe um, some young people, like some 16 and 17 year olds who are, I always hate that we, they get so left out of processes that affect them into their adult years. Um, but as we're considering amending this, it would be potentially interesting to give some young people a chance to engage if we're adjusting requirements. We could also have them part of the uh, working group, but maybe not a non or as a non voting member. Also, realize what I listed off was uh, items that would make them ineligible, not eligible. So there's there's the eligibility is opened up. The ineligible is the part that we were constricting them as 
but not the ineligible. And we could have members and we could have non-voting members on that working group. I think one thing we were looking at is how many applicants do we get? Do we get 12 applicants or do we get 1,200 applicants? The and school district has done a nice job of integrating young people. So if it's something we decide we want to do, it might be worth asking them how they have done that to, you know, kind of, we do need an element of efficiency here um, and not just idealism, but that might be a good place to help us. And, and these working group meetings are all open to the public. And then everyone will also have the opportunity to uh, submit their own redistrict map. Uh, and then that goes to the, the working group. Council, Council Chair. Go ahead. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to, uh, I will be very supportive of uh, the idea of removing uh, uh, registered voters from, for, you know, as a, you know, as a requirement for, for it, for it. Um, you know, and I, I think that it, that is a, not only a symbol, but it means a lot in, in communities like mine. Uh, so I will be very supportive of removing that. So you should, you're supportive of not requiring them to be a registered voter in this case to be one of the, the voting members of the redistricting. That's correct. Or are you looking at them being a a member of the board, but not a non-voting member. I mean, I will be open to to any of those, but uh, you know, ideally, the, your your for the first one. Okay, I'm looking to the other council members and maybe the attorney's office on uh, that uh, idea. I'm happy to jump in. Uh, hi, council members. I'm Katie Lewis, Salt Lake City Attorney, and I'm here with Boyd Ferguson, Senior City Attorney. And uh, as I understand it, these committees are being created to assist the council in making their final recommendation. So as long as the recommendation complies with the legal standards of federal, state, and city code, then the participants in the recommending committee can be whoever the council thinks best helps you make your decisions. So one way we could look at that, if you wanted to go that way, is to eliminate that requirement as eligibility, but have it as a question on the application. If we wanted to go that way, unless other members are not uh, in favor of uh, restricting the eligibility to registered voters. I think it's fair to ask about it. Could we do something in parentheses that says like this may not be, may not, you know, affect eligibility, but I think it's a fair question to ask if people are registered, but just give them a parenthetical on it. Under that approach, we would move the question, are you a registered voter out of the qualifying list of questions? that the chair read earlier and move it into the lower section where it's just your basic, your name, your address, how long you've lived in the city. I see I'm getting a lot of nods of that's the way we'd like to go. I mean, I don't really think it needs to be a question on the application at all, but I'm not, I'm fine either way. And Mr. Chair, one another question. Um, does does removing the registered voter requirement take us back to the question that Councilmember Valdemoros asked about um, non-residents of Salt Lake City people who do not have an address in Salt Lake City, or do you feel like that um, that item is decided that it does need to be a resident? I would, uh, my opinion would be, I would like the people to be a resident of the city. If we're going to redistrict it, I'd like them to be uh, a resident making that decision or making that recommendation to the council. Uh, 
I don't That's maybe not a registered voter, but as a uh, a member of the city, a resident of the city. Uh, first, I'll go to Council Member uh, Wharton. You had a question or point? Yeah, I guess I and this is probably something that will be so, like um, sorted out in the interviews um, or in the selection process for these positions, but um, I like the idea of removing the, are you registered voters so that we can have, you know, people that maybe are non-citizens or um, people that are under age 18. But is, I wouldn't like to have somebody on the redistricting commission or on this committee that um, could vote, is eligible to vote and just chooses not to. Um, because I think if you're not a voter and you're not, um, does that make sense? I don't want to have someone on there that is, has a lot of hot takes about how we should redistrict the city, but hasn't ever, um, been invested in, um, in, you know, following the city issues and, 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 you know, uh, exercising their franchise when they had the right to do so. So I don't have a solution to that, but that's just my concern about about eliminating the question entirely. And maybe again, it's something that can be dealt with in the interview portion. Thank you, Councilmember Baldwin. That's really interesting, Chris. Um, I think I I I think I agree with Chris as well. I don't know how to make that happen but i think it's important um and i think and i want to bring my point back before because i feel like a, there are many property owners um or business owners for example in district four that might not live here but decisions that we make um or elected officials make for them do affect them and they contribute to our budget to our city to our you know to to our community and so excluding them um i think might not be um fair in my opinion and oh so that's one thing that to add property owners or business owners but also on the resident part um i don't know if things have changed um for people that want to run for office but you have to have lived in the district that you're running for for at least 12 months if i recall right and so we might want to do that as well or add that because we don't want you know people to just put an address you know they just decided to move district four we, we didn't know um and then they move out again or something you know temporarily i mean I, we're getting really nitty gritty, but. And, and realize we're discussing right now the application process. We still have to uh, interview them and then select them. So yeah. there's, there's a, there'll be a down select at some point if we get this, you know, 100 applicants. Chair, our, uh, Council Member Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think just to follow up, on a, I guess what would confuse me is if we if we allow an eligibility of a property owner or you know that say you don't have to just be a resident but you can be a property owner then how does that reconcile with the um the need for them to vote so if they own property in Salt Lake City but live in Sandy then they get a point for and they voted in Sandy then like they get a an extra thumbs up because they voted in Sandy. If if like voting and being in a part of the political process is important, but also being a property owner who may or may not live here is important. I'm not sure how to reconcile that that something that could be a contradiction there. Um, I mean, to me whether or not you vote, yes, I want everybody to be voting, um, but seems less important than, I mean, if somebody's like active in their community, but just for whatever reason decides not to vote, um, that again, if we're trying to sort of break down barriers, I, 
that one's confusing to me. I do, however, think that you bring up a good point on property owners because especially in your district, but I think in all of our districts, we have a lot of property owners that don't live here, but the, the decisions that we make do affect them. Uh, I'm, I'm a little still like, but should it affect them more than the residents that live here? Right? Like I still have a little bit of uh, uh, me. I put the residents higher than the property owners, right? Um, because what our decisions affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. Not that it doesn't affect business owners. I, I appreciate you kind of bringing that up and me thinking like wanting to kind of mull on that a little bit. But I, right now I would say that property or residents have like that higher rung for me on being on that working group than property owners. Just my two cents. Councilmember Mono. Yeah, thanks. Um, my two cents on that is similar. I think that uh, primarily I would like the commission to be consist of residents. I think, you know, we talked about one from each district and then some at large members or additional members and maybe the at large members can be business owners. I think I'm more interested in I think there's a distinction between well, there is a distinction between property owners and business owners or business people that work in the city. And I'm more interested in people that work in the city than people that just happen to own property in the city. Uh, personally, whether they own a business or they work for a business that is doing business in Salt Lake City, to me, that's a more important voice than someone that just happens to own property that may be from California or whatever else. So, and I imagine those people wouldn't apply anyway. Um, but I, to me, it's the business owner slash member is more, that voice is more important to me to hear than just the property owner. Of course, owning property is a business, so how do you draw that distinction? I don't actually know. Um, but I think um, the and so that's my two cents on that issue. I think one thing that's going to limit us is just how many people apply, because we may not get that many applications or that much interest to begin with. So to that point, can we get somebody who's been through this before 10 years ago to just give it a sense of what the time commitment is for these residents we're asking to apply so that we can be clear with them um, about what to expect if they are to apply for this. Does anybody have that background or experience? So the last time redistricting happened, the commission met four times and then concluded that it had four maps, two for the city council districts, and two for the school districts to be recommended to the council. Since the school districts are not being handled this, this cycle, it will only be the council districts. So the workload could be less. So that's why we're thinking four meetings of the advisory commission is a fair guess. And I, I think we also did spend time um, on their own, you know, looking at at the maps and reading the materials and things like that. So I think they all came prepared um, to some extent in uh, for the meeting. So I would think a couple of hours of uh, two or three hours in meetings, two or three hours for each meeting for prep time, Ben, do you think that's a reasonable guess? Yeah, we would share the the briefing video from last Tuesday by the Gardner Institute as kind of background, as well as the briefing today about the legal requirements and considerations. And, and I, I want to stop the, this discussion at this time. We'll go on with Kay, but th realize that first we have to get the applicants. I think we've asked a lot of questions about the selection of the applicant, but right now we're looking at the eligibility of the applicants. So, uh, Ben, if you want to uh, give it a shot on what you think our applicant process is going to look like, uh, go ahead and state what you think you what you've heard so far. What I heard is removing the registered voter question as a qualifying criteria, moving that into the basic information section. And we can also add the question, and this wouldn't be for the applicant, it would be verified with the county clerk if they're an active voter. That's a term from the state saying, did you vote in the last election? 
that's public information. So that could be provided by the county clerk. So for council members that want it, it would be available. The application period would be two weeks and we would send out through all of our typical communication channels, the link to the application and the person would need to go to the recorder's office to show their ID and submit the application. And the application can be filled out online. So we don't need to worry about handwriting legibility. So I, I throw it to the floor. Is that, uh, is everybody in agreement with that application process? Uh, and we would start it immediately and go for two weeks. I think I got a thumbs up from everybody. So Ben, that's a, that's the uh, route we take. And in a couple of weeks, we'll, uh, look at the number of applicants and we'll we'll go from there on selection. And for anyone in the public who's listening, I think we'll start the clock tomorrow and close it two weeks from now on that Wednesday at the end of business, 5 p.m. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, without further ado, I turn the time over to Katie Lewis. Thank you very much, Council Chair, and this has been a great discussion. Um, I'll, I'll take it a step back on why we're here and why we're only talking about City Council redistricting and not the school district, because if you looked at the memo that we attached that we updated from 10 years ago, there's quite a bit of information about the school district. So the general rule under federal law, state law, and city code is that the each district in both city council districts and the school district, the districts for the school district, must be in substantially equal population. And that's really based on the, the constitutional provision that every individual must, their vote must count. And so redistricting is, is a way of ensuring that there's not discrimination and that your vote counts within whatever district you live. So 10 years ago, the city council redistricted both the city council districts and the school district districts. Uh, that's because at that time, the boundaries of the school district were the same as the boundaries of the city. And Utah law says that if the boundaries of the school district are the same boundaries as the city, or they're all within one city, then the city legislative body has the authority to redistrict the school district. Uh, in this year's process, the boundaries of the Salt Lake City School District have changed just a little bit based on an annexation, and a, a portion of Salt Lake City School District is actually in Mill Creek. Utah code says that if a school district crosses municipal lines, then the, the county legislative body has the authority to do the redistricting for the school district. So, you know, that's that's where we are in this particular situation. And we can, you know, in the next few years, if that's something that the, the city council wants to address with the Salt Lake City School District in terms of, and, and Mill Creek in terms of those boundaries, maybe you know put that on your list but for now for this redistricting process you are only addressing the city council districts so i'll stop there and just see if there's any questions before we go into a very brief discussion of the legal requirements on on the redistricting any questions on that okay great so the process for redistricting the existing city council districts, really the, the, the main principle for you all to remember is that under Utah law, federal law, and then as reflected in city code, each district's population, not voting population, but population must be substantially similar. It doesn't have to be identical in amounts, but it has to be uh, a, a reasonable deviation from each other. And some courts have had said, you know, 10% is probably your uppermost limit. And I know that Ben has a, a little math chart to talk about what those deviations are. But really the, the point again is to ensure that everyone's vote is counted and every district is equally represented. And so the population should be substantially equal. Uh, an, another point that I'd just like to bring up is, in the context of redistricting school district 
districts, there are additional principles. And those are not only should they be equal, substantially equal in population, but they also should be contiguous. So no little peninsulas or weird jagged lines. And they should also be compact. And that's that's measured on actually the, the length of the boundary line, if you measured that. So it shouldn't be a really long and narrow uh, district that should be sort of compact. And, and the point of that is to really uh, keep communities together and not be separating and, and dispersing votes in awkward ways. So we think that those principles, even though they really have been applied to school districts, are important for you all and your recommending committee to consider for the city council districts as well. And it's it, it's sort of a, it makes sense as a principle to apply it to the city council also. Uh, are there any questions about what I've said so far? Okay, the final point is just sort of a little a little asterisk in case you're thinking about this and I don't I don't know where any of you reside, but if you happened to during your redistricting have your place of residence moved into a different district, there is actually case law and and principles that say that you can as a sitting council member remain on the council uh, even though your district uh, the boundary line will have changed. So Again, think about that as you're thinking about these boundaries and looking at maps and, and considering the recommendations of, of your committee and of your fellow council members. That's my general overview. Boyd, I don't know if, if there's anything else you, you think are important to, to add, but that, I, those are the high points for me. No, I think you did great. Thanks. No, thank you. Great. Any questions? Councilmember Romano. So can you expand on that sitting council member living outside of their district issue? Because the legend of District 5 is that there's a little bump for council member Jill Love. And was that just because they, even though it wasn't legally required, they wanted to allow that to happen? Or is that just a legend and not true? What's the, what's the, do you know the history? I don't know, the history is less important, but what does the law actually say? And, and why might we want to do that anyway? I don't know the history of uh, the the bump for previous council member Love Boyd. I don't know if you or Cindy do, or if it's if it's even you know yeah, if there's. I wasn't aware of that. I could address that. Um, one of the informal guideposts that the council set at the time was um, they didn't want to have anyone outside of their district. Um, and so there had been a pretty significant change in that district, but they but they did not want to create the situation where someone lived outside of their district. So so they just made that policy choice. That was just a council priority, not mm -hmm. a legal mm -hmm. obligation. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they also had a council priority of trying to recognize um, physical uh boundaries so to speak natural physical boundaries like if there is a giant uh, gully or that type of thing that was that was viewed by a community as a natural boundary uh that you wouldn't draw a map that would go and scoop over one street on the other side of the the gully or you know things like that where it was you're just using common sense so that you're not um not creating uh, people who are isolated um, and and that type of a thing. So they there were just some of those informal guideposts. And I think, Ben, I don't know if they're in your report this week, but we could bring those back to you. Um, the ones that were used the last two times, you may or may not want to use them. It's, it's not urgent to figure it out now, but just uh, we can do that in, in the next briefing. Uh, the memo includes the, the guiding principles. Um, I don't know if he was planning to touch on, I think, all seven of them. Um, happy to pull those out and email them to the council as well. And just to throw this out in addition to the guiding principles, if, if there are any directions that you would like to provide to the advisory commission, and Particularly what comes to mind is if you want to say, give us a maximum of say three maps or whatever number you're comfortable with. 
And if you would like the advisory commission to rank or score them based on those guiding principles of compactness, you know, contiguousness, other factors. So they could tell you map B scores better on preserving communities of interest, but it may be less compact. Um, if that's direction you want to provide to the commission, that's helpful for staff to communicate to the commission. And so they know that going into the process. So our main goals for today were to, to give you that additional overview information and to get from you the criteria for membership. And the reason that we're not asking you to set a number of, of participants is we thought, well, what if you um, happen to have like seven great applicants, one from each district, plus you happen to have two people who have a great deal of um, knowledge about um, data and mapping and community involvement or things like that. So we thought what we could do is, is if it gets up to like 14, that's probably too many. But you've given us some feedback today about uh, attempting to include younger people and things like that. So we can do that. And then um, it, the decision on which of the applicants serve on the commission will be, <laughs> excuse me, will be up to the council. So we'll be back to you with, with um, that information. And we can also have voting members and non-voting members on that working group sure. if you want to. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Councilmember Mono. I guess one priority that we haven't talked about that I would be interested in um, at least signaling to the applicants uh, as important is that when there is a kind of a traditional neighborhood that is either already split by council boundaries or is in a location where it's likely that they would be considered for being redistricted to a different boundary, like they're on an edge. Um, I would think it'd be good to encourage participation from that. I'm thinking Wasatch Hollow, of course, but also Central Ninth, where it sort of sits on the intersection between Currently, it's split between four and five, but it's also close to two, and those are the three districts that need to adjust the most to equalize the numbers. It seems like that may be, um, it could go into any district, I could imagine, just based on where it is geographically and the fact that the three bound three districts that are closest to it are the ones that need to change the most. I, I would be really hopeful that someone from that community can represent that community because it just seems like it's going to be obvious mathematically and geographically that it's going to be in the crosshairs of potential redistricting. So um, I don't know how to do that other than to just say that that's important. And if we get applicants from that area, um, use that as a consideration. I don't know how to put that in the application other than they could self-identify that I think my area is important because of whatever externalities. And council members are free to um, recommend people who, uh, you know, to suggest to people in their communities to that they apply. Um, so the uh, so you could make an effort, uh, council member, to to mail to that area or to use your list to identify people who live in that area and, and reach out to them. Um, and I want to emphasize that the the district redistricting in Salt Lake City is entirely nonpartisan and has never, ever, ever been political in any way. So it's a it's it's not a competition among council members or among districts or anything like that. So we feel fortunate um, for that and having the commission uh, helps with that. But there's no you don't have to be. Um, you know, particularly strategic about um, uh, looking for people who have a certain view. You just need them to be knowledgeable, knowledgeable people who are in interested in helping the city. Well, thank you very much. That was a great discussion. Katie, thank you very much. Boyd, thank you. Ben, as always, nice work. Appreciate it. That ends that discussion and our next item is tentative break. All in favor, say aye. <laughs> oh, Councilmember 
Fowler is in agreement with the break. Okay, so we'll report back here at 4.10. And we'll, I think we got a quorum here, so we're good to go. And I think we got the recorder going. So we'll move on to items seven and eight, all things water with Laura Briefer. And uh, I'll also, uh, before I turn it over to Laura, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sam. And we also have Rusty Vetter on the line somewhere to also uh, help us out. He's a senior city attorney. So thank you all for joining us. Sam, to you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, there are just really three major topics. I don't know what order. Um, Director Briefer and team plan to go in, but there's the kind of the historical and regional water policy context that the department is going to talk with you all about, and that uh, includes issues that have intersections with state and legislature policy. Um, there's the watershed, just the overall history and context of the city's watershed where the water supplies for the water service area come from. And then um, finally, there's an ordinance proposal in front of you, all the council being briefed uh, in conjunction with these informational items. And that has to do with uh, officially designating the city's water service area. It's congruent with the water service area, the historical water service area. So no change is being made. It's just going to codify the, the practice that's been in place. Um, and it's going to codify that as a result of a recent constitutional amendment, D, which was approved by the voters in 2020. Uh, so with just that little bit of context, Mr. Chair, I'd ask to turn it over to the department for the rest of the story. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, I also have, in addition to, to Rusty Vetter, we have our two deputy directors here, Marion Rice and um, Jesse Stewart. And I'll be doing make sure we have all the experts here we need. Um, to, to kind of go a little further with your explanation, Sam, I, I think because we just came out or are still coming out of a pretty significant drought year. And there are um, some, there's some great interest in Great Salt Lake and a lot of um, sort of policy proposals for Utah Lake. And in the past, we've had um, legislative interest in our watersheds and extraterritorial jurisdiction authority. And we're we are entering uh, the 2022 legislative session where water is figuring quite prominently. Um, we wanted to sort of give a um, sort of historical context and a look ahead on how all of these various issues related to the city's water resources and water interests a basis for um, further conversation and for some questions. Uh, we do have a presentation here and um, I'm happy to have Taylor or um, whoever's sharing the presentation to start sharing that for us. Thank you, Taylor. All right. Um, so if we could just go to the next slide, please. Um, so throughout this presentation, I've kind of divided this up into first talking about the city's water resources, where our water comes from, where we hold direct rights, um, the amount of planning, you know, sort of the, the legacy of these resources. We are um, beneficiaries of a lot of planning by people before us um, with respect to our water supplies. Um, then I'll roll into our watershed and the upcoming legislative session and then the designated water service area. Um, this uh, cover slide for the water resources piece uh, features um, Lake Blanche in Big Cottonwood Canyon. That's one of our protected watersheds. We are so fortunate to have such a beautiful resource that we cooperatively manage with other agencies um, here in the Wasatch Mountains. 
Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a high level overview of our sources of drinking water. Um, we primarily receive our drinking water from surface water sources that come from the Wasatch. And that comes in the form of streams that we directly intake into treatment plants in Little Cottonwood, Big Cottonwood, City Creek, and Parley's Creek. And then um, as part of our membership in the Metropolitan Water District of Salt Lake and Sandy, we, are, we have access to uh, surface water sources contained in uh, Deer Creek and Jordanelle Reservoirs. Um, we also have groundwater sources. With respect to the Cottonwood Canyons and City Creek and Parley's Creek, Salt Lake City holds direct water rights in those sources, as well as direct water rights for groundwater. And we have um, on the order of uh, 30 drink groundwater wells that we can tap um, with plans to expand that as well. Um, on average, about 55% of our water supply comes from the Cottonwoods, City Creek, and Parley's Creek, 35% from Deer Creek, and groundwater is about 10%. Um, these can vary on a year-to-year -year basis depending on climate and hydrology and snowpack, um, but that's pretty much consistently been our 30-year average breakdown of how of, of the allocation of sources to supply um, the demand across our service area. Uh, next slide, please. And this is, this is another way to look at where our water comes from in relation to where we are situated. And this map actually was developed as part of our climate vulnerability where we're trying to look at the vulnerability of different watersheds where our surface water sources emanate. So um, on the uh, left side of the map, towards the top, you can see Great Salt Lake. And then towards the bottom left, you can see Utah Lake. The yellow area is Salt Lake City and our service area, um, which includes Mill Creek, Holiday, Cottonwood Heights. Um, those blue shaded areas are the, those four streams that we currently have direct rights in that supply our drinking water. And then if you look further east to the right of the map, uh, you can see that through our participation with Metropolitan Water District, we also capture water supplies um, that emanate from the Weber River, Duchesne, and, um, uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, through through waters and the Provo River watershed areas. Um, one of the things that's remarkable about the city's water supplies are just how close they are to our service area. Um, if you lived in Los Angeles, this map would look a little different where your water supplies would be coming from, you know, 100 miles away um, through these enormous aqueducts. But we are extremely fortunate that we have water supplies in such close proximity to us in addition to having water supplies where we have um, pretty good control of because of our water right ownership. Um, and again, this is great planning um, from people way before us. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that planning history in a, in a little bit. So, um, also, uh, when we start talking about some of the water policy issues, I think it's important to look at how these watersheds sort of interact with Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake. Um, so Utah Lake to the south is, is the upstream portion of the watershed through the valley, and then the, the mountain watersheds feed into um, the, this basin, and then it all ends up in Great Salt Lake. Um, so one other thing that's really interesting about where our water supplies come from is um, with a few exceptions, most of it is all contained within a single basin and watershed that ends up in Great Salt Lake. Next slide, please. So the foundation and history of our water city's water supply, uh, this is really important First off, because it shows how incredibly critical 
those local Wasatch Mountain water supply resources are, the Cottonwood Canyons, Parley's Creek, City Creek. Um, they really made the foundation of our water supply and they were the reason why the Salt Lake Valley and Salt Lake City in particular had the opportunity to grow and prosper um, and, and provide for, for public health and, and these basic services. So the first diversion of water um, by, uh, by the pioneers that entered into the valley was in July, 1847, that was City Creek. Um, by 1860, um, all of the mountain streams were appropriated for agriculture. Um, these are the mountain streams along the east bench of the, of the valley. Um, we then started to participate in some regional long range planning efforts for water supply. Um, the city was instrumental in forming the Metropolitan Water District of Salt Lake and Sandy in 1935, um, in part because of the growth that we were seeing, but also in large part because of the, the major drought in the Dust Bowl era, where the city recognized that we also needed to have water storage in addition to this direct stream flow um, from the Wasatch. Um, then in the 1930s and 1940s, a, a lot of the major water storage projects were um, built per the 1929 planning effort. And then in the, in the 1950s was when the city um, built its first water treatment facilities. Um, I think it's interesting to note that in 1929, um, that was that long range plan um, proposed and then the development that followed that met much of the infrastructure that we have today, both in the city and regionally. Um, so it just shows sort of the, the scope and scale of water supply planning. We plan for generations ahead. Um, a lot of this takes a lot of time um, and a lot of very careful and deliberate decision making. I think also it's important to note that in the 1950s, when the water treatment plants were constructed, um, that was the result of typhoid outbreaks in the valley. Um, and one of the things that occurred was at the time, um, we were required through interstate commerce requirements to provide for clean, clean water. And so there was a significant link between um, water quality and the availability of water and sort of interstate commerce coming through um, Salt Lake City at the time. So anyway, as I said before, I think this history just shows that the central Wasatch Mountain water resources were really the foundation and they are still the foundation of our water supply today. Um, by the way, the photo here was of um, Mormon pioneers coming off of Big Mountain um, in July of 1847. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, and expand a little bit about um, these exchange contracts that the city has. Um, so in the mid 1800s, when our city population was growing and um, and actually the kind of Salt Lake County population was growing and needed more reliable resources, a lot of work was done to find out, find the best way to get water resources to residents and, and the population, um, the areas that were becoming more heavily populated. Um, and a lot of things were tried. So. You know, people looked at the Jordan River as a potential source, but one of the problems was the development was happening uphill from the Jordan River. And at that time, you know, you couldn't just pump water up to those areas from the Jordan River. Um, at the same time, farmers who had appropriated a lot of the Wasatch streams needed a, a firm and reliable supply of water for their crops. So their last crops of the season actually were often in jeopardy because the streams from the can the Wasatch Mountain Canyons, you know, Big Cottonwood, Little Cottonwood, and others tended to dry up later in the summer or, or become um, the, the flow became a lot less. And so the city constructed the Jordan and Salt Lake Canal in 1882 um, 
to actually convey the city's Utah Lake water rights in order to exchange um, the mountain stream water to serve our growing population for the needs of the farmers who had appropriated those streams. Our first exchange was in 1888. That was between Salt Lake City and the Parley's Water Users Association. We provided Utah Lake water for irrigation through the Jordan Salt Lake Canal in exchange for the water rights in Parley's Creek. Um, we still have about 50 of those exchange agreements in place today. The Jordan and Salt Lake Canal um, is still alive and well and conveying water. Um, the map that I'm showing on this screen is actually from a 1902 federal investigation report um, where the federal government was very interested in how water was being managed in Utah and they did a great big report on it. It's quite fascinating. Um, but they they painstakingly mapped out all of the um, water systems within the state and and within this part of the, within the Jordan ba Jordan River Basin. You can see to the top of the map is where Salt Lake City was um, at the time. It, it had since grown. At the very bottom of the map, you can see just the the northern end of Utah Lake, um, and then you can see Great Salt Lake on the the upper left corner. Um, so currently we have a pump station at the outlet of Utah Lake and one of these red lines um, along the east side of the Jordan River is the Jordan and Salt Lake Canal and, um, and that water still gets conveyed to the head gates of, of again about 50 different um, private canal companies through the Salt Lake Valley still an extensive system. And also the Jordan and Salt Lake Canal was actually hand dug at the time. Um, and I just am always in such awe at um, the engineering of that canal because the elevation had to be just right to get the water um, to flow by gravity to these areas. Uh, next slide, please. So I also wanted to talk about um, something that's been going on now for decades, but really started um, in earnest with a lot of funding behind it with the state is the Utah Lake Jordan River water right adjudication. This is a, a state led process in which um, water rights are adjudicated in court and um, we've been part of this process, but basically it's it's the state adjudicating all of the rights in this basin and and really it encompasses just about all of Salt Lake City's rights. Um, and so Rusty has been working alongside us to file water user claims um, for all of our water rights as we go through like the, the adjudication divides the um, watershed into these little regions. And so We've got different regions that are being adjudicated, different phases of adjudication over time. Um, <clears throat> I pulled up on the right side, you'll see the, this filing for water in the state of Utah. That's a diligence claim that Salt Lake City filed with the state in 1987. And when you file these claims, you file the date in which it was first put to beneficial use from a water rights perspective. That's, and that sets the priority date of the right. The older the right, the higher priority um, we have in terms of using water from that system. Uh, Salt Lake City has some of the oldest rights in the state. Um, and I think this one might be the oldest right, the priority date for City Creek, which is July 23rd, 1847. So, <laughs> um, that was an interesting find for us during the adjudication, and uh, and we, I think I think the state had said that was our oldest right, or the state's oldest right. Um, next slide, please. And so then I wanted to go into sort of the history of our watershed protection and jurisdiction. Um, so. I like this. I like this photo. Oh, could you go back, please? Thank you. Yeah, I like this photo um, showing Salt Lake downtown Salt Lake City with the Wasatch Mountains in the back, um, because 
by just looking at this picture, you could see why this city in an arid region of the country is able to thrive. Um, these forested watersheds in the Wasatch capture storms that come in from the west. Uh, they create water supply reservoirs in the form of snowpack. The snow runs off in the summer and spring and is gravity feeds our system and provides water that we need to maintain our health and prosperity. We're not the only ones in this nation that rely on forested watersheds for our water supply. Um, according to the United States Forest Service, about 180 million people in over 68,000 communities nationwide rely on forested lands to capture and filter their drinking water. Um, Forest Service lands are located in source areas in many important rivers, as well as local and regional aquifer systems. They are the largest source of municipal water supply um, in the nation. They serve over 66 million people in 3,400 communities across 33 states. A lot of major U.S. cities that might seem distant from forest, forested lands actually rely on water from national forest system lands. These include Los Angeles, Portland, Denver, and Atlanta. Um, and they all receive a very significant part of their water. So, so the national forest actually is a huge partner with municipalities in the provision of drinking water. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about Salt Lake City's protected watersheds, um, we're, we're talking about our watersheds that are protected via city ordinance. Um, alongside some um, policies that the National Forest Service has in their National Forest Plan, as well as health department ordinances. Um, and right now, those protected watersheds are City Creek Canyon, Carly's Canyon, Big Cottonwood Canyon, and Little Cottonwood Canyon. Um, on the right, I'm showing the um, uh, photo of another one of our um, Watershed Canyons, I think that's also in Big, Big Cottonwood Canyon. And the um, public engagement <clears throat> logo for Keep It Pure um, from your mountains, from the mountains to your top. This is something that we rebooted over the summer as well and um, continue to work on in terms of a public education campaign. Next slide, please. So some watershed perspective statistics. So the, the map here on the left, um, I don't know if you can make this out really well, but um, you can see a yellow outline um, along these canyon areas. To the north is City Creek Canyon, and then to the south is Little Cottonwood Canyon, and then you can see Salt Lake City um, on the left side of the map. Um, that yellow outlined area is the area where we have regulatory jurisdiction. Um, and it's decided due to um, where our treatment plants are. So where the intake is for the water coming from these streams, everything above that is where we protect the water um, from any kind of pollution. Um, so that's about 190 square miles in area. Um, the elevations of our watershed vary from between 5,000 to 11,000 feet above mean sea level. Um, as I mentioned early, earlier, the proximity of our watersheds to where the point of use for the water is quite close, it takes less than 24 hours for a drop of water to get to a tap in Salt Lake City from our watersheds. Also, as you know, it takes minutes for us to go visit our watersheds too. So it's very close to the urban core, um, which is one of the reasons why so many people like to live here as well. Um, there are multiple government jurisdictions involved in managing these watersheds, and so my department takes part in a lot of collaborative work. Um, and the, these include the National Forest, um, also Salt Lake County, both their planning and zoning divisions, as well as the Salt Lake County Health Department, um, as well as their flood control and watershed divisions. Um, we also work with the state of Utah and different 
departments and divisions there that include UDOT, who have roads through some of these areas, um, and different divisions in the Department of Natural Resources, ranging from wildlife resources, where we work collaboratively on stocking Bonneville cutthroat trout in um, Lambs Canyon and in uh, Little Dell and Mountain Dell Reservoir, as well as Red Butte as well, um, Reservoir. Um, and uh, as well as their watershed restoration group. So there, there are a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of agencies, a lot of people with intense interest in this area that work collaboratively on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and one of the things we work collaboratively on is managing recreation. The visitation to these watersheds um, is greater than Yellowstone National Park. Uh, more than 5 million people a year. Um, that's, that's a lot to manage. We've got four ski resorts in the area. So we've got commercial recreation and a lot of dispersed recreation throughout the area. Um, our department works a lot on trailhead facilities. Bathrooms are a big deal for us because um, that's one of the risks in terms of water pollution um, is sanitation. Uh, we've also got two cities within our watersheds, the town of Alta and the newly created town of Brighton, and we have a lot of collaborative working relationships with them as well. Um, next slide, please. So sort of some historical context here. Um, there's a lot of a lot of great history um, if you if you look for it. <laughs> And um, the photo to the right or to the left here, that's Gifford Pinchot. Um, he was the first um, forest chief forester for the National Forest. Um, the next photo is a mining town that was at the head rod waters of Little Cottonwood Canyon, where the town of Alta currently exists. Um, the, the third photo from left is at the mouth of City Creek, um, and actually that's, that's through Memory Grove, really close to where our 4th Avenue well currently sits. And then the next article was a 1909 article um, in the Salt Lake Herald um, that talked about how the federal government was coming to Salt Lake, Lake City to help us improve our water supply by planting trees in Big Cottonwood Canyon. <laughs> um, the context here was surrounding water quality. Um, a lot of people don't realize that many of our watersheds um, are in a process of restoration from previous um, development and use, uh, mining, logging, um, a lot of recreation. City Creek Canyon actually was closed for 12 years. Um, after we had typhoid outbreaks, um, in large part due to a lot of recreation in the canyon um, that just, you know, got pretty out of control and, and that canyon needed to close for some time to restore itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Runoff flu was something that was talked about in the Salt Lake Valley, that first flush of, of runoff um, often caused people to get sick. Um, and in part because of a lot of the mining and deforestation that had occurred. So a lot of work has been invested into these canyons over the last century, <coughs> excuse me, in order to um, make it so that we have a reliable source of drinking water so that our water quality is good. And I'll just say that that work has paid off. I mean, since the City Creek um, incident and, and after our treatment plants were built as well, but we've had very good water quality for the last century and, um, and continues to be good. And we work really hard to maintain, maintain that and to closely monitor developments that occur, that occur in the watersheds and, and other risks. Next slide, please. Um, there is a quite a um, network of inter integrated and interrelated regulatory and policy contexts for watershed protection. 
And one of the most important is the federal and state safe drinking water statutes. <coughs> so um, we as a public water supplier are required to meet Safe Drinking Water Act require, um, regulations. And that includes regulating for over 90 contaminants um, in a water system. Um, the, Sa the Safe Drinking Water Act specifies four different um, uh, ways in which we mitigate pollution and protect public health. And the first and most important one is to protect water at its source. And so source water protection is part of what that watershed jurisdiction is that the city currently has and, and has been doing for quite some time. Um, Salt Lake City Ordinance um, 1704 and 1708, those are the ordinances that um, we regulate uses or activities in the watershed. So that's where you would find um, the ordinance prohibiting or restricting dogs and other domestic animals, <coughs> um, stream setbacks for development, uh, sanitary conditions, and those kinds of things are all found within that ordinance. And we have a watershed division within public utilities that enforces that. Um, Salt Lake County Health Department regulations. Um, we have joint authority with Salt Lake County um, with a watershed ordinance that mirrors our watershed, our Salt Lake City watershed ordinance. And then we work closely with them on land use and zoning. Um, the Forest Service has a forest plan that um, puts the protection of water supply <coughs> and water quality as its primary focus in the Cottonwood Canyons and Parley's Canyon. And then there are federal laws that inform the Forest Service planning and direct it that were established in 1914 and 19134. And then state law under um, 10.8.15 um, that is the law that gives municipalities the authority to regulate um, for water quality purposes in areas that are outside of their city boundaries. So that's the that is the state law that gives us the authority to enact our watershed ordinance in areas like Big Cottonwood Canyon and Little Cottonwood Canyon, Parley's Canyon that are outside of our city boundaries. Next slide, please. Um, with the management of our watersheds, um, we take that really seriously and we have a watershed management plan that has um, key strategies that we implement every year and you see this in, in our budget every year as well. Um, <clears throat> that watershed management plan is currently being updated and we'll be doing a lot of public engagement starting in the spring and summer. Um, but these key strategies have to do with land conservation and stewardship. So we have a fund that we purchase land for permanent watershed protection. We currently have over 30,000 acres of land across our watersheds that we steward in that regard. <laughs> we have a lot of partnerships. I talked about the public education aspect with Keep It Pure. And we've also talked about the regulatory aspect with our watershed ordinance. Um, also, our plan um, prioritizes the purchase of irrigation shares of those um, exchange agreement contracts that I mentioned earlier um, so that we can reduce the obligation of providing um, water through those exchange contracts. And then, of course, monitoring <clears throat> is, imp is an important component of um, managing our watersheds, mon monitoring the water at the source, and mon managing or monitoring the water as um, it comes into our distribution system. Um, we prepare a water quality report. Um, that's something that's required under federal and state law as well. Uh, we prepare that annually. Um, this is the cover for our 2021 report where we talk about all of our water quality monitoring, what we've found and what we've done to protect our water resources from pollution. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. And then none of our plans and studies really 
um, stand alone. They're all interrelated. Um, and so the watershed management plan <clears throat> that I talked about uh, links to our water supply and demand plan, as well as our water conservation plan. Um, we are in year five of a five-year climate vulnerability assessment with the University of Utah. Um, and then we've got a lot of other um, kind of related studies and plans in place that we update every few years, including um, uh, our water rate studies, which we're proposing in fiscal year 23, um, so that we can capture sort of the cost of service and um, look at the priorities that the community has in terms of how we uh, pay for water. Next slide, please. And um, what we expect to see in this year's uh, legislative session, um, I prepared this slide over the weekend, and there are already about four or five more bills to add today. But we do expect to see quite a few water-related bills um, on water conservation, uh, maintaining flows to Great Salt Lake, regulatory needs like um, the upcoming federal lead and copper rule that's part of the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, as well as some regulatory needs that the state engineer has on managing water rights. Um, we are watching for legislation impacting our ability to protect our watersheds. Um, back in 2018, there, were, there was proposed legislation that would have limited the, any municipality's ability to protect its sources of water from pollution. Um, that didn't, um, that, that failed. <laughs> um, there were some minor changes to that particular state statute, but we are continuing to watch for that as there are always rumors every year that that might come up. Um, I didn't put this on the slide, I forgot, but we also are going to see likely legislation related to Utah Lake and we've been working a lot on that during the interim over the last year with um, state representatives. Um, but the concern with the Utah Lake legislation, which was also proposed last legislative session, the Utah Lake Authority, is again, Salt Lake City has direct water rights in Utah Lake that we rely upon to meet our exchange contract agreements. And um, the legislation last year gave us a lot of concern with respect to um, interference with those water rights. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, the next part of this presentation is on the designated water service area, but I'm wondering if, um, Chair Dugan, if we want to um, entertain any questions or comments before we launch into that piece. Are there any questions at this time, or do you want to go ahead, Councilmember Fowler? Thanks. Hi, Director Briefer. Um, I had a quick question about the area above, sort of over in the foothills, um, where there has been talk of potential mine or something up there. Um, I know at one point it had kind of been brought up it was a couple of years ago about us potentially buying that area to uh, make sure that there was some mm -hmm. conservation of our watersheds in that area uh, what are your thoughts on that and the potential of something going in there or a mine happening and what effect that would have on our watersheds so uh, yeah, the proposed, there are two mine proposals there. One is a small mine <clears throat> and then a much larger mine on about 600 acres of land. Um, and uh, the the area, the land that is proposed for the mine is actually outside of our protected watershed and downstream from the Parley's water treatment plant. Um, <clears throat> however, we have a lot of concern with respect to water quality um, because even though it's not part of the drinking water system, Parley's Creek comes into the city and um, 
The city actually has some responsibility for water quality on our urban stream systems through our stormwater permit. So my our stormwater utility that's part of um, public utilities de department. <laughs> I'm also, um, I've read through the proposals and um, there are air potential air quality impacts. Um, and I mentioned the water quality impacts and the proposal um, says that they will mitigate those impacts by using water to um, either settle pollutants out or to um, do dust control. And um, I've looked at what water is available there and I'm a little bit concerned that um, there's not a water resource available there except for the city's own water rights. Um, and so that's something that I have brought to the attention of the State Division of Oil, Gas and Mining. There's supposed to be a public hearing on um, the 25th of this month that we intend to um, provide some comments for <clears throat> as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about that proposal. And I know that there are other communities such as Mill Creek City, um, and particularly their residents in the Olympus uh, Cove or the, um, yeah, the area that's close to the mouth of the canyon that already gets impacted by dust from the other mine that's up there. I would um, assume <clears throat> that if the proposal includes using some using water as mitigation for air quality issues that that would have an impact on stream on the flow of streams to the Great Salt Lake as well. Is that right? Um, I think I think it would divert water from the system that's not already diverted for a use. Um, the city doesn't provide water through our distribution system to that area. Um, there are, we do have water supply contracts with um, like residents, for instance, in the Mount Air community. Um, and so I don't know if there is an assumption about whether the city would enter into a water supply contract with the owners of the mine, but I don't think that would fall within how we've normally looked at providing water outside of our jurisdiction. Um, and then and one other question, if I may, Mr. Chair, do we have um, an update on when the aqueduct is, or the pipe, the line, the water line, you, I'm pointing to my street outside, <laughs> so you know. <laughs> it's going out, out west, out <laughs> northwest. Is, where is that in the process? Uh, yes, I think you're talking about the east-west conveyance. That's it. Um, I, I'm going to see if Jesse knows the specifics. If not, I can give you an update on the completion date for that. Um, I think we're still we're still in the planning process for that, so they're we're doing it in phases. I'd have to look at what the exact timing is for your area, but I think we can send you an update on that. Yeah, that would be fine. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? All right. I think we'll continue. Thank you. Okay, and um, so this is um, the next agenda item is our Salt Lake City designated service water service area ordinance. Um, and um, I'll just say that's a picture of our big cottonwood water treatment plant um, and the 100 year old weather station that has been there for a long time. We just received an award for from the weather service for that, the continuous readings on that weather station. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so <clears throat> this isn't, first I want to talk a little bit about our, our water service area and how it came to be outside of our city boundaries. Uh, so the map on the right shows in, in red 
Salt Lake City's corporate boundary. And then in blue, the area where we serve water outside of our service area. Um, so that service area really developed over the last century. And a lot of that blue area actually was unincorporated Salt Lake County um, at the time of development. Um, over time, well, actually I'll back up, but I, I, I have read some historical accounts where when the city was asked to extend its water system um, outside of whatever the boundaries were at the time that we would be annexing those areas into the city. Um, but, you know, of course that existing blue area, that never happened. Um, and then over time, cities incorporated on top of the water system like Mill Creek and Holiday and, and Cottonwood Heights. Um, and those cities, you know, really benefit from having that system there. They don't have their own water system or, or their own water rights. Um, we currently serve portions of Mill Creek, Holiday, Cottonwood Heights, and then little areas of Murray and Midvale and South Salt, Salt Lake. Um, and then we have an advisory committee <clears throat> that um, by ordinance, the makeup is three residents of the service area outside of city boundaries and then six within Salt Lake City boundaries. Um, you'll note that <clears throat> our water service area does not include up in the canyon areas at all. So it really just follows where our infrastructure exists at this time. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So um, the reason why we are creating a designated water service area is, um, as Sam mentioned, the passage of Constitutional Amendment D and then some um, companion legislation from 2019, House Bill 31. Um, <clears throat> and really this is to provide um, clarity that municipalities have authority to provide water outside of their city boundaries. I think something like 70 cities within the state of Utah do this and the cons th that part of the cons state constitution um, <clears throat> was a little ambiguous about whether or not that was allowed under the constitution. So that this just clarifies that. Um, <clears throat> and then HB 31 not only wanted us, wanted a map created showing a designated water service area but also had some other requirements like an advisory committee, um, some really modeled after our advisory committee, um, <clears throat> as well as some other things related to rate setting. Um, all of those things we already do, but we didn't have an ordinance that designated a water service area. So, so that's what that ordinance um, is complying with. And I, I know I have Rusty here as well. So Rusty, if there's anything you wanted to add about that ordinance, please feel free. No, I, you gave a great summary. It's really quite simple. And um, as Laura said, we're we're following the, the new requirement of the law that we established this map and then it's sent on to the office of the state engineer. So yeah. if somebody has any questions, they yeah. can find it easily. I think I think it's important to note that um, the genesis of this constitutional amendment came out of uh, thousands of hours of work after the 2018 legislative session, where we had a trifecta of um, proposed legislation that included the restrictions on extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, it included some legislation. Um, that was the precursor to HB 31 that had some problematic issues for us and other cities in it. And then it included the idea of a constitutional amendment that um, actually met, might have removed the prohibition for cities to divest of water rights, which we did not want that to happen. Um, and so this constitutional amendment and HB 31 um, really came out of some intense negotiation over that, the interim periods after 2018. 
And I, I know Rusty spent <laughs> a lot of time, as did a number of other folks. I think Sam was at a lot of those meetings as well um, to try to wrap our arms around a lot of the issues because this didn't just affect Salt Lake City. It, it had a statewide impact on municipalities um, throughout the state. So I'm really happy about how this turned out. And I think um, in the long run, this is this really serves us well. So <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. I think that might be the end. Yeah. And there's one of my favorite trails. I'm not saying where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura. Any any questions for Laura or Rusty on water? I think we have a question. Yes, Ms. Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Laura, a quick question on plans for the old shooting range. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that property is part of our watershed portfolio, um, and <clears throat> we have entered into a voluntary cleanup program agreement with DEQ to remediate the um, lead contamination that exists from 50 years of shooting <laughs> activities. Um, and I you know, I do get a lot of um, a fair amount of inquiry about future uses. And um, I think it's important to note that the um, remediation of that site is going to depend on future uses. So if if there's other activity that's proposed on the site, it, it would um, change, potentially change or make the remediation um, more stringent. So, <clears throat> thank you, and thanks for all of your hard work on all of this. And um, what I know will be continued hard work as we approach the legislative session. <laughs> so, please let us know if there's anything we can do, especially um, the, I mean, all of us, but with the legislative subcommittee and things, um, I feel like water is going to be. It's on that uptick again of, of yeah. being in everybody's mind. So, which I'm really glad about. <laughs> yeah. So, that's why Ramon, did you have your hand? Question? Yeah, I didn't actually have a specific question. I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, water policy is so incredibly complex, but also critical to our city and our residents. So, thank you for this. Um, update i'm sure that there's a like we could talk for days and days and days about water so yeah. i'm glad we had this kind of broad overview i'm sure there will be more things and and thank you also for your uh willingness um all the time to respond to somewhat ridiculous questions from me um and i'm sure other council members that don't know enough about water policy but need to so thank you for everything you're doing for the city i just wanted to convey that thank you there's no ridiculous question <laughs> Well, thank you, Laura. You are a great tu tutor for us, uh, and thank you for all your uh, your briefing and your support up at up at the uh, Davis Center on the, the Great Salt Lake Water Summit. Uh, I'm, I look forward to more discussions on water conservation and how we can make sure that uh, the health of the city and the uh, and the and Great Salt Lake uh, continue. And we don't spend a lot of money, but we can save water. So, if there's no other further questions. Thanks for the briefing, and uh, I look forward to more. Thank you. Thank you. Council Chair, I think you're muted. Of course I'm muted. I left the meeting for the break and I didn't mute, but I just talked the whole, the whole time muting. So we have the Utah Inland Port Authority Board appointment. Uh, and uh, that's a requirement for us to appoint someone from the council to the board. And um, 
It's replacing uh, Council Member Ferris, who replaced Council Member Rogers at this position. So I'm entertaining anyone who would like to throw their name in the hat uh, or for anyone who wants to nominate someone to throw their name in the hat. Mr. Council. Chair? Yes, Council I Member Fowler. I would like to nominate Council Member Petro Eschler um, for this position. Um, I think the intent when we had this was to make sure that somebody um, representing the West Side was uh, on that board. And I think that um, Council Member Petro Eschler would be uh, perfect for that seat and would like to nominate her at this time. Thank you for that nomination. And Councilmember Petroesser, would you like to make a few comments? Thank you, Councilmember Fowler, for the nomination. Um, I am very interested in this seat. I have been preparing for it since before I declared my candidacy um, through uh, citizen participation in a lot of things surrounding it. Um, this is one of the top three issues for constituents as I walked around and spoke to them and knocked on doors. And um, I would really appreciate the chance to advocate for particularly the West side, but generally the entire city um, and, and grow inroads where I can to make sure that our voice is elevated and, and heard. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to throw their name in the hat? So I, since we're online this time and last time we were uh, in person and we actually filled out a form, a paper form, I think we can go to the chat function and and individually uh, go send it to uh, Jennifer. I think, so Mr. Chair, I think on this one, uh, it's not an election of the vice chair or chair. I think you can just do a straw poll. I saw Cindy Lou just popped on video, so maybe... Oh, um, she okay. can clarify. So I think you can just take a straw poll. You'll take a formal vote on the 18th. And so that will be the official record, but you can just take a straw poll tonight, I think. And I second Jennifer's proposal of a straw poll. Thank you. Okay. Well, Councilmember Fowler's uh, nomination is a straw poll. Everyone give you a thumbs up or show your opinion. All right. Wonderful. There we go, we got all of us, seven to zero. And we're moving on to item number 10, report of the chair and the vice chair. Councilman Romano, do you have anything to report? I do not, thank you. Neither do I. Number 11, report announcements from the executive director. Hello. Uh, two quick things. One is um, that the um, Association of Municipal Councils, it's affiliated with the Council of Governments, and they have a um, subgroup that is uh, council members who meet monthly. Uh, right now it's um, remote meeting and has been for quite a while now. But um, Council Member Mono has been the Salt Lake City representative there. And now, as he's vice chair, he can no longer continue because um, it's at the same time as the chair vice chair meeting. I believe it's on um, the sec I don't know. It's on a Tuesday. I think it's the second Tuesday Sorry. every month, but I don't. Thank you. I was guessing. <laughs> uh, yes, second Tuesday at from twelve to one. So. Um, it's it to me is a significant networking opportunity and getting to know the um, other council members in the county. Um, we do rely on the other councils in the county uh, when there's an, a legislative issue that affects Salt Lake City or uh, when when there's opportunity to share information on on similar issues. So, if is there anyone who's interested? Would you like to express that now or think about it and get back to the chair or me? Councilmember Fowler? 
I would be interested, but I, that's all. I'm just saying that I would be interested. <laughs> I can make, I can go longer, but I don't think that I need to like go into any further than just saying I'm interested, unless you want me to. Mr. Oh, Chair. wonderful. Thank you. We'll take your interest in heart and we'll probably give you a vote as I won't say, but I, I'm all for it. So do we do we vote on that now, straw poll, or do we get the vote? Right? You you don't need to vote. You can just so just by mutual agreement accept a volunteer. Everyone give Amy a thumbs up and she can have the position. Okay. All right. Then Wonderful. Thank you for volunteering. So we have that. Okay, the next thing is the public utilities. Um mailings and it's it's a great thing because council members get to put um, one newsletter per year in with the utility bill the utility bill doesn't go to every uh, residence or property owner but it goes to a lot so it saves a lot of mailing money uh, there's a, a a limitation a physical limitation uh, because we can only put three three different districts into one mailing um and we they only have two months a year for us because the other months are dedicated to other things so we've tried different ways um to offer to pay the um incremental cost of having more opportunity and things like that but we haven't struck on anything yet that would work uh, so for right now we have um an opportunity one opportunity per year for each council member and the months that we have available uh, made, made available to us are April, August and December and we don't have any tricky restrictions this year because we don't have anyone up for election so it's a matter of when you think you would be ready and when you might um, might feel like doing that so three three council members at a time is the maximum April, August, December. Do you want to think and get back to your liaison and we'll do first come, first serve? Or would you like to express now? Which, if you already know, you can just express now. I, uh, Council uh, Member, uh, Chair, uh, I uh, I have been uh, looking into this uh, and you know I don't necessarily have you know an issue in any of those months months i would love to to be included on those but i think if i had to choose i would choose the december one okay and cindy i would want december as well please okay so we have two people in the december slot um anyone um, else know already what they would like to do i would choose august okay all right councilman romano is august I can literally be ready whenever. Assign me to wherever you have gaps. Okay. All right. Flexible. Thank you. Did you say April was available, Cindy? April is available. April, August, and December. April. Okay. April. All right. I'm like Victoria and happy to just go wherever. Okay. All right. And I think I'm the last one. I'll take August. Okay. Very good. All right, so we staff will uh, work with you on selecting topics and and that type of thing, and we'll continue to engage with public utilities, uh, perhaps as technology changes, there might be um, ways to get around those physical limitations that that exist. But for now, my understanding is that's the best we can do. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Cindy. I appreciate that very much. Uh, next time is a tentative closed session. We don't have a tentative closed session. So that concludes our work session for this January 11th, 2022. Meeting is adjourned unless there's any other comments. This might be a record. We can last longer if you want to, but I think we're going to. Don't say it. <laughs> Don't say it, Darren. I'm just celebrating. <laughs> I'm just celebrating our extra evening. Yes. <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of those hours. Good night. <laughs>